illustrate what I see as the pathology uh, of epistemology. I do believe that we in Europe are in an epistemological crisis. We do not see our way through because actually the way in which we think is hemmed in by our preconceived ideas. Um, you do read Hungarian, don't you? No, I don't read You don't read Hungarian? No. Okay, then let me put this, it's a methodological question. Suppose that I were to write a book about the United States without knowing English, I would be laughed at in court. Nobody would take me seriously. But we expect it to take you seriously, and you don't know Hungarian. Now this, this is the great Central European dilemma. It's the linguistic deficit. People pass judgment on us without actually understanding us. I don't think that's fine. I think it's actually something much worse than that. I could call it fascism, but that is an overused word, so I won't. Let me, I'm so sorry, can I respond? Do you speak all 27 languages of them? No, but then I don't, I speak about seven or eight. Um, and then some, uh, three of them speak English, um, two speak German, actually three speak German. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not on very good terms with the Slavonic languages. But then I don't go into depth. As Hans has done, there's a great depth on Hungary. And I don't actually think he's really understood about two thirds of the story. But let me begin at the beginning. Um, you began with culture, and you mentioned Liszt and Ligeti. But are you aware that both of them were born in places which are not in Hungary today? Uh, Liszt was born in Rhein, which is now Austria. Uh, Ligeti was born in Trnavan, uh, St. Martin, which is now in Romania. So this tells you something about how Hungary has been transformed is part of the, the way in which Hungarian culture has had to contend with the 20th century. Some of it's our fault, not all. Um, dialogue, absolutely, but don't forget that requires an act of will on both sides to understand, to break out of the fixed epistemology, otherwise you're going to dialogue this evening. Mm -hmm. And that, I fear, is where we're heading to. <coughs> you see, let me reveal a small secret. I've <coughs> written an article that will be published very soon in the Aspen Review, it's in English, um, about Hungary and Orban's project. Uh, and someone I'm going to say uh, is in that article, some of it is not. Now, what I do believe is that we're living in a world of liberal hegemony. I use the word hegemony same sense as Gramsci did. I think it's okay for me as a centre-right person to quote Gramsci, Gramsci was left-wing, but I have been criticised for doing exactly this, but I think that some of the best theory actually are come, come from people who are on the left, like Foucault for example. Indeed, neither of you mentioned the word power, but we can come on, come on to this. But what I, I see as, as having arisen is this liberal hegemony which I think begins from a moral declaration about what a human being is, projects this universally on the rest of the world. In other words, it becomes a colonial project. I mean, the liberalism of the 19th century spilled over into colonialism, the power of which was generated by the success of markets in the 19th century, then became, became extended to, if you like, the conquest of the rest of the world by the West, or the West conquered the non-West. Uh, we're going to see the consequences of this over the next 30, 40 years. I do not think, I'm not a universalist, I do not think there's a single humanity. I think humanity is infinitely various, and the European version of it is just one among many, but we arrogate to ourselves the right to say, this is how human beings must be. Human rights, when you look at it from a non-Western perspective, is an instrument of power, and it's not right. We think that human rights are the right way of doing the life to your I fully accept it, but please, I mean, listen to what the Chinese say, listen to what um, some of the Said could, you know, 
Well, do this on those great Islamic theory and say they're not very happy about it because they see it as a Western instrument for controlling the long rest. We, we have to have the dialogue with people who, with whom we deeply disagree. Now, when it comes to the understanding of the world, the hegemony, what we're looking at is the production of knowledge, the production of legitimation, the determination of what is a fact. I've done some work on this. Um, I recommend anybody else who wants to read into this to read, obviously, Kuhn, uh, Uzi Fleck. Um, a very interesting book came out maybe four or five years ago by Eric Uzi, saying that actually facts are constructed. Facts, in any case, are context dependent. And facts are some, you know, they have a life cycle. Uh, there are facts which become unfact. They disappear. They are no longer uh, regarded as something to be taken seriously. So when we talk about the way in which we should look at the world, which I think is what the liberal hegemony tells us to do, uh, we keep screening things out. There are questions of interpretation. We do not have, we cannot have, the totality of knowledge. That's an impossibility. We always have to choose. We have to select facts. What are the criteria by which we select? Who determines the criteria? That's the key question. That's a power question. So, um, for example, we were talking about Hungary. We talked about the constitution. Okay, let me admit that I was involved in a little way. Um, the Prime Minister set up a working group in 2010 to think about a new constitution. I was part of it. Actually, the constitution of 2010 12, that's when it came into force, overlaps very largely in so many ways with other European constitutions and indeed with the 1949 Stalinist constitution as amended uh, in 1989. Uh, the gap is not that large, it's about 85% of overlap. But no, it's seen as in many ways a kind of terrible invention by the Fidesz government. Note, by the way, that the Constitutional Court in the last five years has thrown out about 76 laws by Parliament that never gets reported. Did you know that? Hungarian Constitutional Court? I studied it. Yeah? Paragraph so, uh, by paragraph. No, 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 that it has thrown out 76 laws. Yeah. I mean, that's not a weekly Constitutional Court. It means there are checks and balances. Uh, the standard requirement, uh, or actually they work better in some other countries that I could mention, of democracy. Now, where I think uh, the present state of play uh, in Hungary comes is that there was a liberal experiment, 2002-2010, it was a disaster. It was a catastrophe for Hungary. The Hungarian economy was collapsing by 2010. We nearly went the way of Greece. We didn't quite, uh, and there are, that in a way is what all of our <coughs> to transform. Uh, he took all sorts of unorthodox steps, that's the Hungarian word as well, basically saying that the combination of market fundamentalism and social liberalism, while an excellent elite ideology, results in terrible inequality. Let me mentioned another subject, others have mentioned the very recent events in the United Kingdom where obviously I grew up. Um, I was in London over the weekend, my family lives there, they all live there, people who are also Remainers. You start going north of London and the further north you go, you have deprivation. Material deprivation, intellectual deprivation, semantic deprivation, it's, it's not a very good life. Go to places where you know, don't just go to London, I don't know, go to Wigan. Revisit George Orwell, road to Wigan here. These are miserable, downtrodden places which have not shared in the wealth of London. They don't particularly care for the diversity and multiplicity and liveliness of London. They don't have the human dignity. And that, I think, is why they, or the only reason, one of the reasons why they voted against the European Union was voting against the government and so much else. So it seems to me if you're looking at 
market fundamentalism, you have to look at the consequences. Markets do not produce equilibrium. Or if they do, then to quote the immortal Keynes, we'll all be dead anyway by the time that that happens. Uh, let me say a few more things because uh, I've already taken up some of your time. So, illiberalism. Now, I'm looking at my computer because somehow I have a shrewd suspicion that this is going to come up. So let me read you the same passage, but slightly differently, from what Huddleston has um, I brought it in Hungarian, but luckily I have some computer vision. So, key passages. A race is underway to find the method of community organization, the state, which is most capable of making a nation and a community internationally competitive. There is no necessary connection between a liberal state and economic success. The stars of the international analysts today are Singapore, China, India, Russia and Turkey. I don't think he would say Russia today, but he would 2014. So, what we are trying is to find the form, the form of community organisation, the new Hungarian state, which is capable of making our community competitive in the great global race and in this sense, and that's my emphasis, in this sense, the new state that we're constructing in Hungary is an illiberal state, a non-liberal state. It does not reject the fundamental principles of liberalism such as freedom. Now that's not the way in which that speech was recorded. People picked up the word illiberalism, ran with it, well, there's the international media for you, freedom for media, uh, and so on and so forth. They do report according to their own lights, according to their own epistemology. Very difficult to leap over your own shadow. The illiberalism is in no way in conflict with fundamental rights. And that is the point I'm trying to make. I don't think that Fidesz is a far right party. Fidesz is a centre right party, but has not been captured by liberalism whereas much of Western conservatism has been. That, of course, puts us in a slightly awkward position from time to time. Central Europe, V4, this, I think, is one of the areas where Hungary has played a major role, the Michigan form. Uh, I'm not going to go into great detail, except to say that the migration crisis has brought these four countries together in a way, brought them together much more closely, including one, one administration, Relations between Hungary and Slovakia have never been good, and that's putting it mildly. The Prime Minister of uh, Slovakia, Robert Fico, says, what the Hungarians are doing is wonderful. I couldn't believe the evidence of my senses when I encountered that. That's to do with the way in which Hungary was strictly applying the law. Schengen, Dublin III. The fence that was put up was not to keep people out, as you would gather from the international media, do read in a fair number of languages, but it was to ensure that they were, went to the proper places where they could be registered, as they have to be under Dublin III. The media played a very, very negative role in this. Um, on the European Union, we are committed to the European Union. We are not a Eurosceptic party. This is not a Eurosceptic government, but we contest some of what the European Union is doing, what the Commission is doing in terms of extending, expanding its powers. The Prime Minister talks about um, enlargement of the powers of the Commission by stealth. The word he uses is lock off the door. It's this ident identical idea of stealing. Actually, it isn't. It's all in the public sphere. I know this is a member of the Constitution Committee. There is a continuing tide of pressure towards enlarging the powers of the European Union powers of the Constitution. That's partly what the referendum in Britain was about. That's partly what the, I call them the new political movements, whether on the left or the right, are about saying, no, there has to be a stop to this. I'm a moderate integrationist myself. Uh, I do disagree with my government on some things. Uh, because I still continue, I still feel very strongly that what the European Union has done 
is to serve as the best method of conflict resolution that Europe has ever had. No wars. I'm just old enough to remember.